bonjour, euh, bonjour à toi et à tous. Euh, nous sommes vraiment ravis d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui pour ce panel euh, qui va parler un peu des sujets des drones. On aimerait bien aborder en fait euh, euh, les drones en tant que plateforme, qu'est-ce que ça va donner, le futur, euh, les possibilités. On va prendre cette occasion quand même de présenter quelques-uns de nos projets. Mais bon, pour, pour commencer, je voulais bien mettre au clair que ça va bien passer en anglais. Euh, moi et John, on est venus d'Angleterre. Alors, c'est un accent bien au nord de l'Angleterre. Euh, on travaille tous les deux dans un studio d'innovation qui fait partir de l'université, euh, University of Central Lancashire. On travaille euh, à Media Innovation Studio. On a même Darren, Darren aussi, qui est venu d'Angleterre. Il est un ingénieur, aussi bien à l'université. Et puis, on est très, très contente d'avoir parmi nous aujourd'hui Ben, qui est venu exprès des États-Unis pour être parmi nous aujourd'hui. Et ce qu'on fait, ce qu'on va faire, c'est quand même de parler un peu des applications des drones du côté civique et civil. C'est-à-dire que qu'est-ce qui se passe au niveau humanitaire il y a beaucoup de projets euh, au monde euh, entier, en fait. Euh, au niveau humanitaire, il y a des camps de réfugiés. Euh, on va mettre des capteurs, par exemple, sur des drones pour, pour vraiment voir les températures des gens, pour savoir s'ils sont malades ou non. En, il y a même des projets qui s'agit de la livraison, que ce soit la Poste, euh, Amazon, euh, Domino's Pizza... Euh, il y a même des projets de sauvetage, c'est-à-dire euh, en Iran, par exemple, il y a des projets où on utilise les drones pour euh, protéger des gens à la mer, euh, ou même euh, au niveau de préservation euh, en Afrique. Alors, il y a beaucoup, beaucoup de projets, et euh, on va passer, en fait, euh, je vais simplement me présenter vite fait. Moi, je travaille à, à Media Innovation Studio, c'est grâce à ScienceCom que je sois là euh, ce mois, en fait, je fais un petit visiting. Euh, je suis spécialiste plutôt des médias sociaux et puis des modèles de revenus qui correspondent à tout ce qui est technique. I've got Darren here, who is working in drone technology now for 10 years. He used to work with BAE Systems. He's now leading the aerospace engineering um, arm and an intelligent systems um, research group. He is the engineering lead of the Civic Drone Center. Ben um, has recently been appointed a new beta fellow with BuzzFeed, uh, which is an entirely new uh, innovation lab starting this summer. And he's the very first fellow that they have appointed. Uh, so we're really very pleased that you can be with us today, Ben. He's otherwise a freelance journalism technologist um, and an international drone journalism innovator. Uh, ben has worked at the University of Nebraska and with the Kenyan African Skycam, the Columbia Tau Center for Digital Journalism, CCTV Africa, Vice News, and the African Wildlife Foundation, as well as an archaeological project in Turkey. Finally, last but by no means least, is John, uh, who's working at the Civic Drone Center, which is part of the Media Innovation Studio, on a range of humanitarian and sensor development projects for drones, uh, as well as developing the Drone Makers Lab. So without any further ado, as we'd say, um, Darren's going to lead you through a few projects that we've developed, uh, one of which is called AeroC, about connecting webs, uh, drones to the web and connecting drones to social media. Okay, thank you, Claire. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, as Claire said, I, I have an engineering background. Um, I, I joined the university approximately three years ago from industry, and it was a great time to actually start work on UAV projects, civil UAV projects, with, with the, the team you've seen um, on the stage with me today. We, 
One of our first sort of projects was um, a look at how we might be able to uh, connect a drone to the internet and use the power of um, an online community to help with a, a drone uh, mission. Uh, I was just wondering if we could just bring the slides up at this point and I'll start talking through what we actually did on, on that. Um, there we go. Is that okay? Is that click working? Okay, so one of the projects that we, we, which was really our first attempt at connecting a drone to the internet, was a project called Air or Sea. And this project was um, conducted in, in northwest England, and it was an attempt to see how the in, a drone plus an online internet community could actually help with a search and rescue mission. So we was actually helping um, a mountain rescue team to evaluate the use of drones to see how effective they might be as a, as a tool that a search and rescue team could use to, um, to help find perhaps an injured walker who may have had an accident on the hillside. Um, and what we really wanted to do was, rather than just fly a drone, land the drone, and then look at the imagery and the video, we actually wanted to stream that, that, that imagery in real time over the internet and use uh, an online community to help us try and locate the missing person. And the, the test was to see, can we do it much more quickly than searching on foot, walk, walking around, um, uh, which can take quite a long time. So what, what we actually set up was, um, in this little diagram here, you can see we had a drone that was linked to a ground control station. And then we linked that ground control station to the internet. And we set up a, a little website where people could look at the images in real time and see if they saw the, the missing person in the image. Uh, I'll show you some of those images very soon. Um, and we actually, um, what we was looking for people to do was click on the images if they saw perhaps where they thought the missing person was. Um, and then we could analyze all of that, that data uh, that the, all the clicks on the, on the various images in order to then direct the emergency services to the, to the correct location. So if we, we just move on to the next slide there. Thanks. So this is an example of some of the images that we took in the trial. So as, as the aircraft was flying over the hillside, it was taking a series of, of uh, still images, pro approximately one a second. There was a bit of overlap between the images and they, um, they were uploaded to the website, and uh, basically what happened was, there was a website like this where, this is an example image, where if you thought you saw the missing person, you would actually click on the image, and you could tag it, like, just like you might tag a photograph on a social media site. Um, and basically, the, that, that sort of ended up with, um, one of the images actually had the, the missing person on the hillside. Um, it was really quite a successful trial. After we uploaded this image onto the website, it took just 69 seconds for the missing person to be located. So if you compare that to the amount of time it would take on foot to actually do that search, it sort of proved just how effective that sort of technique can be. So uh, we're taking this idea forward with other sort of application areas now to see where the power of the online community coupled with a drone can actually uh, be a much more effective solution. Just, just before I, I hand you over to Ben, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the future for, for web-connected drones and, and just what are the benefits, really. Um, the good thing about a drone, of course, is that it's mobile, it can move, and we can reposition it. So if you've got something that you need to sense or measure, um, you can actually deploy a drone to do that. Um, so you've got an awful lot of flexibility and adaptability there to, to put a sensor where you need it. Um, so for example, a, a small drone could land somewhere and do a sensing task for a while and observe its surroundings and then perhaps move to somewhere else, which is very useful in surveying. And of course, you can carry um, a modem on board the drone. So you can 
bring web, web connectivity to the drone very easily using something like a 3G or a 4G modem. Um, and of course, you can carry uh, a, a computer on board the drone to start processing the data. Um, and that, that connectivity in that computer will actually allow you to remotely control the drone you, from the internet. So you could actually control some of the flight parameters where you'd like the drone to fly to, um, or you could control the sensing package and the, and the task that the drone is doing. So I think that you're going to see a lot more of this in the future, and a lot of the new drones that are uh, being put into the marketplace at the moment actually have development software development kits so that you can write your own applications for the drones. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. But so I'll, uh, I'll hand you over to Ben now. Thank you. Hi, uh, Ben Kramer. A, a note on the BuzzFeed Open Lab. It's, it's a brand new fellowship. They just released a press release about a week ago. It's, it's worth checking out if you are interested in sort of prototyping hardware or software that incorporates elements of journalism, uh, technology, obviously, but also art. So it's, it's a very interesting fellowship being offered in San Francisco at BuzzFeed's new bureau there. So I work with the Drone Journalism Lab based at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And a lot of what we do has been blogging about the status of, of drone journalism and drones, sort of generally speaking, in the citizen realm. I also work with African Skycam, based in Nairobi. And I work with Dickens Olewe, who is a, a Stanford Knight Fellow right now. And this is Dickens' house. Now, I'm showing you this partly because Dickens could not be here. He's at home right now, probably asleep. But um, I took this photograph. You can see there's a string in the image. I used a balloon because right now in the US, commercial use of drones is not allowed. That means no journalists are allowed to use drones unless they have special permission from the Federal Aviation Administration. I do not have this permission. So I, I was, uh, recently I was experimenting with balloons as an alternative uh, to, to drones in the US. Now, this here is the, a quick shot of the hacked together balloon rig. It, it has a GoPro. Uh, you can see it's, it's like what you might find underneath a, a drone system, but it's for a balloon here. And it worked fairly well, um, as you can see, flying over Dickens' house in California. And there's a shot, another shot from the camera. When I do work with drones, I'm very careful not to create any, uh, any conflicts with people who might be around. Um, this, this was recently an issue that I really wanted to bring up because in Nepal, following the earthquake uh, at the end of April, a number of media companies, foreign media companies, went to Nepal to report on the situation. And in mid-May, the government banned drones, allegedly because of the way that foreign media were using them to cover the, the earthquake damage. So, to show you some of what I've been doing, my projects, because I can't work in the S, have been taking me around the world. So Turkey, that first shot, working with archaeologists in India, uh, covering soccer, uh, traveling with a drone and just using it in the field. This here was in Kenya, covering a rally race. This is with African Skycam here. Uh, this is at the Dandora landfill, also in Nairobi. Uh, this was doing a project with CCTV Africa at Ulpa Jetta Conservancy. Uh, doing, doing wildlife stories in Tanzania here, Manyara Ranch. This is also for CCTV Africa, for broadcast television, as you can see here. Um, really, a lot of what I've been doing is just showing this is how journalists can use drones in the field, and also figuring out what goes wrong, how to solve problems, and seeing what kinds of interesting perspectives and uh, visuals we can get like with this giraffe and did also did some PR work for African Wildlife Foundation and the Kenya Tourism Board. Working in Turkey, uh, working with archaeologists, I try to branch out from journalism. I take storytelling 
very broadly. So working with archaeologists to document sites. Um, basically, at this site here in Turkey, they brought me in as a substitute for this guy on a fire truck because I could get shots that they wanted like this, which you cannot get from a fire truck. You cannot get this angle or this altitude. But with a drone, it's very straightforward. I've also been doing 3D work. And to show you, Maybe, we'll see if we can get it. Okay, okay. Okay, so this here, this is my website, and what I'm showing you is um, an archeological excavation in Turkey that I've captured in 3D and turned into a three-dimensional model. So I, I captured photographs, stitched them together into a 3D model, and I posted it online. It's as easy as posting a YouTube video onto your website, um, basically using Sketchfab. You can create this. Okay, so you can basically fly around a three-dimensional space. It's kind of like a video game, and this was all created using a drone, which I'll show in a moment. Because that's just a single camera, isn't it, that produces that? Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm using the DJI Phantom 2, which is a very, very common and relatively inexpensive drone system. And to take the images to create that model, which is a very long story on how to do that. I will not get into that in this presentation. But I'm using a point-and-shoot Canon, the uh, SX260. And to mount it to the bottom of the Phantom, I used an L bracket from a hardware store and a bottle cap and some hardware to mount it so that I can take photographs looking straight down, as you can see here. I took this technique of creating three-dimensional models and brought it back to Kenya and created this. Uh, this here is a, is a composite image of the Dandora landfill. It's a controversial landfill in Nairobi. And so I did two things here. This image is made up of about 570 individual photographs. And it was sort of a byproduct, basically, of, of this 3D model that I made of the Dandora landfill. So to show it very briefly. Oh yeah, and you, and you, can, put it, you can put these models into Facebook. You can embed them just like you can a YouTube video right into Facebook. So, oops. Well, I lost it, I have to reload it, but you get the idea. So the models can be viewed in a website, they can be viewed in Facebook, and they are all made just using a, a, a relatively inexpensive DJI Phantom system. Three notes about this 3D work. Facebook embeds, which are really fun and a great way to share the content, in addition to posting on websites and articles, etc. Mobile devices, you can view these 3D models on your phone, on your tablet. Um, and they are also virtual reality ready. Uh, you can actually view the models online using Oculus Rift. And also the idea of audience control. So basically what we're doing here by creating a three-dimensional model of a site versus just shooting video of a site is giving the audience the ability to explore an area 
as they wish to do uh, versus just having somebody who has flown a camera around and is showing you what they want you to see. Now the audience has that power. And very briefly, a look at French drone regulations. Um, note that it is illegal to fly without adhering to the regulations that do exist. Uh, up to five years in prison, 75,000 uh, euros, uh, fine. And if you want to know more, I would highly recommend going to drones.newamerica.org. Uh, it's a very simple interface for learning about drone regulations around the world, which can be difficult to find on your own. So this is a great place to go, once again. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. OK, hi, everybody. Um, my name is uh, John Mills, and I'm based in the Media Innovation Studio in, uh, in the UK, UCLan, University in the northwest of the country. Um, my slideshow does not involve rhino or giraffe, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> Ben's trumped me on that one. Um, but I'll do my best to make it interesting. I, um, I'm affiliated with the Civic Drone Center, and I'm involved in, in a number of its operations. So um, I want to talk to you today about the Civic Drone Center and the type of, um, type of work that we do and that we're hoping to do in the next six to nine months. Um, but in order to give you context, because um, you've heard from Darren, who is kind of the engineering lead, um, my background is in media and journalism and innovation. So I just wanted to talk um, very briefly about some of the other projects that we run in the Media Innovation Studio, some of which that I'm involved with, uh, some of which that uh, I'm not. I think this is important to provide uh, the ultimate rationale why we do this work in terms of um, kind of getting engaged in this range of projects. So um, th there's a picture of the, um, the Parrot drone top right. We also do work around future media, uh, storytelling, journalism. So we're doing projects around Google Glass to see how newsrooms explore that technology, not necessarily from a distribution perspective, but from a content capture perspective. So Glass as a journalistic tool. I completely recognize that glass has been pulled, um, for those of you uh, kind of into wearables, but uh, I'm assured that it's coming back in a different guise. Um, we're also interested in data, big data, small data, different ways of using data to tell stories. So there's a couple of examples on this slideshow. The one is um, the bottom left. We work with uh, explorer Sir Ranulph Fiennes, who um, ran the Marathon de Sable this year. For those of you who haven't heard of that race, it's a six-day race in Morocco in the Sahara um, where competitors have to kind of contend with the elements. And we thought it would be kind of cool to strap some sensors to Sir Ranulph Fiennes uh, to monitor his heart rate, his pace, uh, his activity. We also strapped some cameras on to him and to other people to capture the media as well to start to tell the story on a number of levels uh, of him completing that kind of incredible endurance effort. Uh, and that appeared in a couple of places in the charity that he was running for. Uh, it also appeared in the Telegraph newspaper in the UK as well. So we're exploring what storytellers, storytellers can do with data, with uh, visualization, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the central image, Open Media Innovation, is actually I've stolen from uh, Claire. This is Claire's project, uh, which is exploring media ecosystems and how we can uh, kind of curate, foster, and incubate and generate new digital ideas and businesses. Um, the far left uh, is a brand new project which is called Echo. Now, we're interested in mainstream technology and progressive technology, uh, which is drones and glass and data, but we're fascinated at the Media Innovation Studio by disruptive technology. So what Echo is is uh, a device that connects paper to the internet. So this is not e-ink or a reader or a tablet device. This is saying, OK, so can you create a digital piece of newsprint, a digital ticket, a digital piece of packaging that will talk to you or that will understand uh, people interacting with it. So it's very much placed in paper, standard print, using conductive inks within the Internet of Things. So we're working with book publishers, uh, newspaper publishers, magazine publishers, and saying, actually, uh, a lot of people think print is dead. Mm, maybe not, actually. Maybe print is a disruptive digital technology um, that no one's really envisaged working in that way before. So um, you may never hear of that again, but that's kind of cool, and that's what research is about. So th they're the kind of things that we're playing with. OK, so um, a core value of ours is community and co-design. So 
we're based in the university, we're a lab, we do research and uh, development, but we don't do it in isolation or just reliant upon our own expertise. We want to engage with communities. We want to engage with our local communities in the city in which we work. We want to engage with communities of interest. We want to basically cooperate, collaborate, and produce and have fun while we're doing it. So this is a, a, a couple of shots from uh, an interactive paper project. We pulled in people from throughout the city of Preston. We asked them if you created a digital newspaper that was still paper but could play audio or collect information, what would that be? So we had a series of workshops, four or five, um, thought about different functions, and this, if the slide works, is what we produced. So the Lancashire Evening Post that is interactive. This is a, a fully working piece of newsprint that you can listen to the full interview for David Cameron. You can rate stories by voting on them. You can connect to Facebook. You can listen to adverts via some Bluetooth headphones from uh, network providers in the UK, which is the bottom banner ad. Or, if you really want to, you can listen to Oli Muir's The singer and an entertainer. He's not my cup of tea, but some people like Ollie. Okay, so uh, the point there is not about print, it's about the methodology. It's about working with people and being inspired by people. So, moving back on to drones. Um, so, as a media innovation studio, we've been aware of drones for a number of years. We've been aware of drones as a media capture device, as an image or video capture, which is some of the stuff that Ben showed, which is fantastic, uh, that goes into places such as Vice and other areas. Um, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, this is a shot from um, the now ended Top Gear program in the UK. This was an African shoot that they did in a number of different countries, I think in 2011. Um, and this was standard of, uh, kind of standard tool that they use as part of their production. Um, so. We're quite interested in how these technologies are being used by industry, but we're also interested in how communities are using them. So hobbyists, people who can buy a Parrot drone for uh, £230, I'm not sure what the Euro conversion is of that, um, and use it for their own media capture purposes. This is a, an image, as you can see, probably copyrighted by Lawrence Cliff. This is a, a school fire that happened within 50 miles of the university. He lives around the corner, he saw the school ablaze, he went, he launched his parrot drone, he took loads of images, um, that's fine. Um, he then sold them to a few newspapers and received a warning from uh, the Civil Aviation Authority, the regulator in the UK. So part of our work is, yeah, it's interesting about communities, but actually we're really fascinated by regulatory frameworks in that there's potential for drone and UAV technology to do a lot of good potentially, both within the media and beyond. But actually, people like Lawrence Cliff, who, who are generating content, covering stories, adding editorial value, they're getting official warnings. OK, so the next slide, Ben, can you help? Um, is how regional newspapers are utilizing this. So uh, BBC production companies are using them. This is the Manchester News citywide paper. They did this legally. They hired a drone pilot. Uh, they created a. 360 immersive experience that they put on their website. You can click on the site. I won't go to it now, actually, because of time constraints, but you can basically see Manchester from the air, that newspaper looking to seek to provide value. It's actually not that interesting a user experience. Once you've done the 360, it's done. Um, they haven't sold any advertising around it. It seemed like they were playing, but kind of they probably more work to do. Um, it's really easy, I think, to get lost in the utopian potential of drones. They're great, aren't they? They grab footage cheap. Uh, you can find missing hikers in 69 seconds. That's great. Uh, this video um, is when a drone goes a little bit wrong. So if this plays, this is uh, from a guy called Robert Knowles. This drone is currently out of control. He can't see it. Um, he doesn't know where it is. Um, the unfortunate thing is that this is near a UK nuclear installation, Barrow in Furnace, where nuclear submarines are kept. Um, Robert Knowles was the first person in the UK to be fined for drone use. He uh, received a fine of only £800, but had to pay court costs as well that kind of bumped that up to £4,000. And uh, I'm amazed that we've still got the footage because um, it gets very wet in a second. There you go. So we're intrigued about how we kind of create drones and UAVs that 
don't do that um, because um, there's a kind of a lucky escape with that one. So within the studio, we think a lot about innovation and we think a lot about the ingredients of innovation and, and what you need. And a lot of the time, it's coffee, to be frank. Um, and over a cup of coffee in our student union building, Darren uh, and a colleague of mine, Paul Eggleston, came up with this idea of the Civic Dram Center. Could we set up a research institution that explored media uses, search and rescue uses, uh, agricultural uses, um, humanitarian aid uses? But we want to deploy the same methodology. So we're not just going to come up with platforms and fly them and, and uh, generate findings that way. So this is a workshop that we did that pulled in people from huge kind of aerospace organizations like BAE Systems. It pulled in journalists. It pulled in coders, designers. It pulled in uh, small to medium-sized enterprises, small businesses in the area, and said, look, if we could develop drone and drone uses, even if you've never thought about using a drone or UAV before, what would that be? Uh, the idea that one was um, a veterinary drone that basically shot sheep with tranquilizers. <laughs> Great. Um, but we also used some other software, some facilitation software, to kind of tease that idea out, allowed people to vote on it. So that community that we invited to that event also voted on what they felt was the best idea. So it's very much owned by them uh, and not owned by us. Uh, and we will work with them to, to roll that out, which I think is happening over the next... 12 months, some of this stuff is going to be moved forward. We've also got funding to spend on this, which is nice. Um, all this is obviously underpinned by the power of the crowd. So I'm going to try to be quite brief now because I realize that um, time is kind of skipping ahead. Um, a couple of projects that we're working on. Um, this one is with Great Circle, which is a flight school in the UK. Um, it's currently illegal in terms of UK regulations to fly multiple drones from one user, in that you need one user one drone. And we thought, actually, software is at a point now where we can maybe subvert that a little bit and say, can you have multiple drone footage using one uh, base station, one control station? So a system that operates four drones, uh, each of them have a different flight path, and we want to kind of roll this trial out at Silverstone Racetrack to be able to do a few things. First, to see if we can capture aerial footage more cheaply than ha chartering a helicopter, which is kind of three, four thousand pounds. We could use drones to do this. But also to start to think about what are the sensors that you can put on drones. Because yeah, you can put video cameras, you, could put, uh, you can generate video and stills, but how about accelerometers? And how about kind of motion sensors? And how about thermal imagery? Could you use drones to capture lots of other valuable content that then, when you're covering races, there's an F1 clip here, probably not that level, but lower denominations could people who race those cars also capture m more footage. Um, we're also really interested in people, as you know. I've said that a few times. And one of the projects that we have tabled at the moment that will happen hopefully in the next six months is based around this statue, which is Angel of the North. It's a really famous statue in the north of England um, created by Anthony Gormley. We think there's something wonderful. Well, I do. <laughs> Some of the people might have a different idea. I think there's, I think there's something wonderful in, in saying, actually, you always see the statue from this perspective. You always see the statue from below or imagery of it. But how about looking at what the statue sees? How about being able to have a drone see the vista from the statue's perspective? And maybe how about allowing individuals to absorb that or control that and collect a range of other data from it as well? So... We're talking to a few of our technologists. We're talking to a photojournalist, a photographer, to say, if you have drones equipped with sensors and cameras and people, what could this project be? And actually, we still haven't quite figured it out, but we think there's something quite intriguing about this. We chatted to people like Ben to say, actually, could we unite other instances of public art in the same way and have kind of an inside-out public art drone exhibition? Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention today is uh, humanitarian work. Um, now, there's an increasing active community. Uh, some of you may well have heard of this organization called uh, UAVators. They have around 900 uh, UAV pilots around the world. They launch or coordinate, Patrick Meyer, who runs this organization, coordinates UAV disaster responses. He's been active uh, on the back of the um, typhoon cyclone in Vanuatu, and he's also been coordinating UAV operations in Nepal after the recent earthquake. Um, we're really intrigued about how people are motivated to help, how people are motivated to do things for the public good. And Patrick, to some extent, has completely kind of not grasped that. That's a really patronizing thing to say, but he's kind of utilizing that 
and rolling that out in a number of different areas. We've come at it uh, practically in a different way, so we're using people in the crowd, such as the Aerosea project, in a, in a subtly different fashion. But we're really intrigued about how UAVs and people can make a difference. So we're looking to work with NASA um, and their SEVERE project, because they chart um, disaster areas. This is uh, SEVERE's mapping of Nepal for using satellite imagery. Now, you probably can't tell behind me, but because it's just a map, but the resolution of some of those images is quite poor because satellites don't always give you kind of crystal clear, crystal clear uh, kind of imagery. However, we're hopeful that using a drone, uh, a web-connected drone, we can stream really good images of, of disaster areas and, and make those of useful to responders, to get aid in, or even to use drones in the opposite direction, to have drones based in and around certain areas of the world that then maybe report back to a central station. Again, these are just ideas and concepts that we're looking to build on the next 12 months of operation, but that's the kind of thinking that we're involved in. Um, we also fly in digestion tanks, <laughs> which is not very sexy or interesting, but we're using these trials where a drone doesn't have access to GPS or uh, kind of longitude latitude readings to kind of create other sensors, so uh, kind of ultrasound sensors. It's quite a dry project, this, mapping the inside of a tank, but we're really intrigued that if we can develop that platform, we can then roll it out to search and rescue, particularly in mine shafts or in caving instances, to allow a drone to kind of find people who may be missing. So that's kind of the underpinning um, logic. Equally, we're going to uh, survey, this is kind of Darren's gig rather than mine, to be perfectly honest. Uh, we're going to survey a, a pipeline that goes into a local bay, goes 2K out into the sea. Loads of interesting stuff there for us in terms of how do you control a drone that's running two kilometers into the sea. Um, there are legal issues in that you need permission to fly. You can get permission to fly before the beach. Uh, in the UK, I think it's something like between the sea and three meters of beaches is owned by the Queen. So we need to figure out whether she'd be happy with us flying over the beach. Um, we also need to work with Coast Guards and, and kind of other agencies to allow UAVs to fly over that, that area. So um, lots of stuff to explore, exa examine, and investigate. Um, this is a final project, very briefly, called Landed. Um, there's a contested piece of land in a city near the university. Um, and we were intrigued that if nobody quite knows who owns the land, how do you get permission to fly there? And actually, if you do fly there and you start taking shots of people, whether they give you their express permission or not, then they're trespassing. And who's responsible for that? Is it the person who flies the drone? Is it the person who captures the footage? Is it the person that uploads the footage? Is it the person who gives you permission incorrectly? There's loads of questions to be answered there. Um, we don't have the answers, but we flew the drone anyway. Um, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> don't worry, there was a risk assessment went in. It was fine. But we're looking to challenge uh, kind of policymakers and legal frameworks in addition to working within them. Because actually, at the moment, and I think Darren will probably talk a little bit about this, and I know that Ben has thoughts on this, legal frameworks are restrictive for a number of reasons. Finally, and I'll be very brief, because I've been talking for ages. Sorry, Claire. Um, there's a drone hack series that we're putting on, which is pulling together designers, coders, uh, UAV specialists, and others, 24-hour uh, drone hack based on humanitarian problems. Um, they start next Friday, uh, and we're looking to roll those out in the UK and beyond. And that's me done, and I'm going to be quiet now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you. We've seen some really interesting projects there. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, and there's obvious applications for the future. So if I can start with, um, with Ben. Um, what You're obviously embarking on this year now of really exciting opportunity to explore. What sort of what sort of things in the future are you, are you is really getting you excited about drones and technology so i'm i'm interested in doing more 3d modeling work so for example in nepal when there was the earthquake uh, a number of unesco sites and a number of heritage sites were destroyed by the earthquake and they will never be seen again as they were before the earthquake so it was a situation where when the earthquake struck i thought it's really too bad that there were not 3D models of these structures because they've been, some of them have been in existence for hundreds, thousands of years, now they're gone. So doing sort of uh, it's kind of preservation work, digital preservation work, digital reconstruction work, um, continuing to do more video work and aerial photography work, although that's pretty, it's pretty standard these days for people who use drones. Experimentally, using sensors on drones. So no, we're not looking for visuals here, we're looking to gather pure data. So for example, in Delhi, which has 
the world's uh, worst air pollution. A lot of that air pollution comes from nearby regions where farmers burn uh, their leftover crops, essentially. And there's plumes of, of particulates swarm in the air and they, and they uh, fly over Delhi, basically. So if we had drones, could we figure out the way that these particulates move uh, in the lower atmosphere, you know, up off the ground a ways? So basically, could we use a drone as a mobile, uh, as, as a, an aerial uh, air pollution sensor device? Why not? Um, otherwise, building off of AeroSea, we've been discussing doing a, a crowdsourced animal count for wildlife conservancies in Africa. Because conservancies, they do these wildlife counts using airplanes. Why not use a drone and then crowdsource the images so that people, anybody in this room, could go online and help the conservancies figure out what their animal inventories are. So. Um, and Darren, on the engineering side, obviously uh, the biggest restraints are battery life, weight, but what, where do you think developments might lie there? Well, there's a lot of work going on in the sort of materials that drones are constructed from, uh, and we're engaged in some a number of projects. What we're trying to do is reduce the weight of the UAV and all of its components, because the battery is really the limiting factor and that sort of dictates how long they can fly for. So we're, we're looking at novel materials for the airframes and for the antennas and trying to sort of extend the, la the, the flight times of the platform that way. And in terms of deciding what we can and can't do, where, where more or less do the regulations lie? Who's deciding? Who is in charge of the decisions about what we can and can't do? Well, certainly in, in the UK, it's the Civil Aviation Authority, and it, it's pretty much the same in, in each country. They each have their own aviation authority that's writing the rules for operating UAVs. Um, in the UK, they're quite restrictive, um, so we can only fly line of sight, they say, so within about 500 metres of the pilot, you have to keep a visual contact with the drone at all times. Uh, the rules here in France are very similar, I believe. Um, I think there are ways of actually flying a little bit further if you're a more qualified pilot here in France. So it opens up more commercial opportunities for the drones when, when, the, when the rules are slightly less constraining. Ben, how do you go about judging the risk that's involved in each one of your projects? Uh, pay, I pay a lot of attention, first of all, to the regulations in the country where I'm working. And then locally, uh, are there a lot of people around? What's the weather like? What's the wind like? What is my altitude? Because altitude can affect the uh, airlift by the drone and, and how much of a payload that it can carry and how that affects battery life. So environmental conditions. Um, yeah. <laughs> and just a final question. If anybody has got any questions, do start to flag, flag them up to me uh, in French or in English. Um, but from my point of view, the, the real beauty of these applications is the connectivity. It's the web connectivity, uh, whether that means connecting people or apps. Any last remarks on, on that potential to get people involved, community involved, the connectivity with the web? Yeah, the, there's one, one area that sort of, you know, it's, we're getting quite excited about at the moment is uh, working with the fire service because they, uh, John showed a, a photo earlier of using a drone to monitor um, a building fire. But of course, the fire service get called out to all kinds of um, situations, things like flooding, earthquakes, um, um, natural disasters of that kind. And by connecting an online community, what you can really do is, is help the incident commander um, plan for that situation. So let's say there's a major flood and people are stranded, then you could connect an online crowd to analyze the data that the drone's gathering and that will help dispatch the rescue teams or help you route vehicles to, to take aid and supplies to them. So I think um, that's something we're quite interested in taking forward and the, the fire service are quite interested in that as well. Ben, any last considerations? Right now, it's, I feel it's important for people who either appreciate the work that that drones and drone operators perform or who have a general interest in drones to, you know, to talk about the technology because in, in a lot of places it's restrictions are coming down. Um, like I said, in Nepal, there's been a drone ban and partly it's because of 
perhaps irresponsible use. So I know that the technology is not going away, but I feel like anybody who who's interested in the technology and sees value in it, you know, talk to people about it and just get people interested and as a way to kind of from a grassroots level get governments to sign off on drone use and and to and to create regulations that are not overly restrictive because right now that's all coming into place and if there is not an active community that's saying you know this this is what works this is what we need without not being too aggressive i think it will really help the future of of drones which can perform a lot of good uh, in society Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, yes? <laughs> Actually, to build drones, US. Oh, sorry, ah, you're talking about sorry. land vehicles, yeah. Yes. We yeah. Land vehicles, yeah. Oh, in the water. Um, so when, we, we, when we actually named the centre and we, we set up the Civic Drone Centre, um, we, we was very interested in air, land and sea platforms. Um, at this sort of early stage in the, in the Drone Centre, we're really only looking at the airborne platforms, um, but we're certainly not excluding other types of um, unmanned vehicles. So it's a possibility for the future. The most important thing, I think, is that we see it as a platform. And really, whether that's airborne, land-based, it's what can be done with it and, and what developments it can take. Thank you very much indeed for your question. I think there was one more. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, you didn't will really talk about autonomous drones. I don't know if it's uh, one of the purposes of your work, but uh, I just wonder if uh, this is possible for, for now and uh, if uh, we're going to see some autonomous drones for the future. O autonomous drones, it's interesting you should mention that because increasingly we're seeing them controlled by sensors, etc. But yeah, Darren. Yeah, I spent a long time on autonomous drones uh, in, in the defence industry. Um, and, and basically, we're starting to see a lot more of that technology come into the civil use of drones now to make them easier to control. So there's far less actually manually flying a drone with a controller and there's a lot more technology going into the software to enable the drones to reason about the environment that they're in and make their own decisions so that is that is a field that's evolving i think you'll see a lot more of that over the next few years because people are reaching the edge of what you can actually achieve with a drone um, without using those kind of techniques any more questions if not, I'd be very grateful if you would join me in thank. Oh, one more. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, just to go on with autonomous drones, uh, Amazon and some other uh, companies just talked about uh, delivering things uh, for their customers using drones. Do you think it's uh, it's something possible to? Uh, are we going to see this in the future, in a long future or not? I don't know. In terms of delivery drones, for, for like delivering packages, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, again, the uh, the companies that wish to do that have to prove that they can do that safely. And so I actually think autonomy is actually a key enabler for safe operations because the drone will be more self-aware. So if it thinks it's got a fault or a problem, it'll be able to land or, or go back to base by using those, those kind of software techniques. So it is, a, it is possible, but if there's a big challenge to reduce the size of all of the sensors you'd need to carry on a small drone so that it is aware of its environment and it can fly safely. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know it's l'heure de manger, so thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Thank you to Claire for chairing our panel today. <laughs>